Now, I know many of you have come to hear our wonderful John Robbins. I've known him for since 85 or something like that. And it's just been wonderful all these years because I, I've been involved, I've been a vegetarian over 50 years, like 54 years, and uh, a vegan 34 of those years. And I have watched, I've been active with the Vegetarian Society of San Francisco 43 of its 44 years. And I've, you know, I've seen the movement from where it was almost nothing growing. And I see peaks, you know, where things happen and, and it just gives a spurt. And all of a sudden people are talking about vegetarianism or veganism. And I will say that uh, like Diet for a New Planet was a little spurt. Certainly what John and Freya uh, Dinshaw, Jay Dinshaw and Freya did was a spurt with the, in 75 with the, the uh, North American Vegan uh, Vegetarian Congress here at Arano, Maine. And then uh, Francis Moore LaPay. And then John Robbins. Woohoo! Yeah. I mean, if people read A Diet for a New America, they can't be anything other than a vegetarian or a vegan, certainly. So I really want to thank you, John, and I'm so pleased that you were able to come this evening. And I know a lot of people came just to hear you. So I'm giving you John. Good luck with the microphone. Thank you. Um, you've all been sitting for too long, and my beautiful and wonderful wife there, we've been together 45 years. And uh, she's gonna, I've asked her to lead something just for a second, and, and you'll see what it is. Oh, I thought you might like a little stretch break, so if you want to stand up. Hey, can you hold this for me so I can talk? Okay. Okay. Uh, how about just reach up a little bit with one arm and then the other arm. <laughs> reach and reach and reach and then drop over and hang and let out a nice, ah. Oh. Slowly roll up. And then how about shake out your hands? Shake out your feet. Turn around in a circle. Keep shaking. <laughs> Turn around the other way. One big more stretch. And one more sigh. Ah. And have a seat. Thanks. How's this for the mic? Is that good? It's been a bit of a hassle. That wasn't good. I gotta stay over here? Behind. Behind the speakers. Maybe on the stage. Is that? Does that work? Okay. I, I feel like the, I have this wire hanging from me. Well, th thank you very much for your patience and your attention and your presence. For being here and hanging in here, um, you're here. And that's a statement. And, and we make statements with our lives. We make statements with how we live, with how we interact with each other, with how we relate to the world around us. How, how we undertake the human journey. And the message, I think, that we convey isn't so much what we say as what we do. It's who we are that others experience. And, and someone once said, people will forget what you said to them, but they will never forget how you made them feel, how they felt in your presence. And when we, we, when we undertake a journey to shift our lives so that they are statements of what's in our hearts. 
Um, we run against the grain of what I call the cultural trance. There is something that keeps us asleep, that keeps us fragmented, that keeps us diminished, depressed even. It's, it's partly in the food, it's partly in how we are with animals, with the environment, with our own spirits, with the possibilities of being human. And what is it that we're meaning to say by being vegetarian, by being vegan, by taking this kind of a path? Maybe we're meaning to say that we want to live healthy lives. That we want to, to, to eat so that our bodies will be vehicles of our, of our spirits, of our hearts, of our compassion, of our purpose for being alive. And, and that we can't have vehicles that are worthy of that task, because it's hard. There are difficulties in life. There are inherently there, there. And we need to be strong if we're going to meet them with the strength, with, with, with the possibilities of our resilience and our creativity and our caring. Maybe we're making the statement about animals. A lot of people probably in this room are. I certainly do feel that the way we relate to the other animals says something about the kind of human beings we are in our, and, and the kind of beings we're becoming. In the United States, each of the 50 states has legislation that prohibits some type of cruelty to animals. And yet, every single one of the 50 states in that legislation exempts from that legislation animals destined for human consumption. So we have in this country, in our culture, a literally schizophrenic attitude about animals. Because on the one hand, we have animals that we call pets, companion animals, I call them. And very often we, we love them, and they, they love us back, and they're part of our families. We, we give them names, they sleep on our beds, we pay for their food, we pay for their vet bills, we, we open our hearts to them. In many cases, those are amongst the most beautiful relationships that people have. They enrich us as human beings. And as a society, we do, in fact, very often treasure our companion animals. But then we call other animals livestock. And by virtue of that semantic distinction, we feel entitled to treat those animals with any manner of cruelty so long as it lowers the price per pound. The laws that we have against cruelty to animals don't apply. Any practice that is considered customary or traditional farming practice is, is allowed, regardless of the misery that it exacts to the animal. Now, when we do that schizophrenia, something splits inside us. Somehow our relationship to life gets disturbed and distorted, and, and the, the work that we're doing is to reclaim that wholeness, that integrity in our lives, in our relationships to animals, in relationships with the whole web of life. The wildlife that depend on a, a natural world, we depend on it too. And, and we know that. And yet we exploit it and we harm it in ways that are almost unimaginable. The disastrous impact of our society. We all feel it. There's a planetary anguish. And how we respond to that, how we live with that awareness, is critical, I think, to the kinds of human beings that we are becoming together. And why we've come to here today, why we're here today, why we are on this path. What is the statement in the face of the destruction, the stupidity, the ignorance, the cruelty, that we want to make. 
somehow we want to take a stand for what gives life, for what ennobles us, for what expands us, for what connects us. Somehow we want to take a stand that's meaningful. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're here, is to be amongst others taking a stand. And each of us does it slightly differently. But then together that stand becomes something completely greater, much greater than any of us could have ever done or been or thought by ourselves. And I want to tell you a little bit about my, my experience of this in my own family. I'm dealing right now with an issue. I have a dear, dear, dear friend, a guy my, my age, but he's not in good shape, and he doesn't, he's a dear friend of mine, but he, he doesn't listen to me much about food. And uh, it's, it's taken a terrible toll on him now. It's, it, he, he's, in, he's very ill. And I spent a lot of time with him yesterday. And um, there's a poignancy for me because he's very heavy. He, he, he's, he, he's, he's, the, he's what happens when you eat the way he has. And I'm in his life. <laughs> and yet he doesn't take advantage of that. The, uh, you can lead a horse to water, they say, but you can't make them drink. I'm, in his, I'm, I'm shoving him into the water at this point. I'm, I'm kicking him into the water. I'm, I'm getting buckets of water and throwing them in his face. I'm just, I, you know, yeah, I can't make him drink, but I'm, I'm going I'm to do everything I can. That's what I know I need to do is everything I can so that I can live with myself whatever happens. Because I, I can't make his choices for him. I can't change his mind about anything. We, we can't. But I, I can do what I can do, and I'm going to do it. And, and we'll see. Um, I've had experience with this before. My own father um, was, a, was a, the owner, the founder of an enormous business, Baskin Robbins, you know, ice cream company, 31 flavors. It was, at, at one time, the largest ice cream company in the world. And my dad and my uncle owned it. My dad started it, and my uncle joined him four years later. And when I was growing up, I was literally being groomed because I'm an only son to take over and run the company. It's a multi-billion dollar company. And um, I invented some flavors. Um, Jamocha Almond Fudge. <laughs> this is very popular. <laughs> and... I, I thought that was the path I would take. Certainly my father expected it of, it of me. But my uncle, Bert Baskin, um, was a big guy, he ate a lot of ice cream, and he died of a heart attack at the age of 54, 1968. And when that happened, my, I, I asked my dad, uh, do you think there could be a, any connection between the amount of ice cream that he would eat and his fatal heart attack at, in his early 50s? And my, my dad looked at me and, and his, his eyes said, don't ever mention that again. You know the elephant in the room that you can't talk about? Sometimes families have taboos that just the Bradshaw would talk about it, the no talk rule in certain families. That, in, in my family, it was that there might be any connection between ice cream and, and heart disease, or frankly, between diet and health. And I could understand why my father couldn't and didn't want to consider the possibility that there might be a connection. And he had, at that time, uh, manufactured and sold more ice cream than any human being who'd ever lived on this planet. He didn't want to think for one second that the family product might have injured anybody, much less had anything to do with the death of his brother-in-law, my uncle, his partner, Bert Baskin. But it did. It did. And it's not just Baskin Robbins, you know that. I mean, Ben Cohen, the co-founder of many years, co-owner of Ben & Jerry's, another big ice cream chain. Lovely man, in many ways, also a very big guy. Had a quintuple bypass in his late 40s. He might not have wanted to think either 
that the ice cream had anything to do with his heart problems. But it did. It did. And I disappointed my father because I decided that I didn't want to follow in his footsteps and run an ice cream company and sell ice cream and invent a 30-second flavor. And, and I decided to go on a different path and take my own rocky road. <laughs> and, uh, and, and to be in integrity with that choice, I, I realized that I needed to tell him and, and live according to this. And I said to him, I didn't want to have a trust fund. I didn't want to have any access to his fortune, which was very large. I wanted to just live by my own values and seek my own way. And I, I, that was my integrity. That was a choice for integrity. And, and Deo and I, she was with me at the time that I made that choice. We had been together 45 years. And, and, and we lived a very different life than my father could understand. We moved to a little island off the coast of British Columbia, Canada. We built a one-room log cabin, very small, simple cab, cabin, one room, where we lived for 10 years. We gave birth to our son in that cabin. We grew 95% of our own food. It was very simple living, very rustic, very primitive, very beautiful. And we kind of weaved our, our, our self back into the web of life. I felt that the way I had grown up, as, as luxurious as it was. You know, I used to jokingly, flippantly say that in my family that I, of origin, roughing it meant that room service was late. <laughs> But we were choosing to actually rough it, to actually face rea the, the realities of life. People use money sometimes to s isolate themselves from other people's pain and, and, and to feel different or better than. And I, I didn't want to have anything to do with that. So um, we lived very simply and uh, gave birth to our son in that cabin and, and uh, just lived a very different life than my father could understand. He had an ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool in his backyard, the back, backyard of the house I grew up in. Um, and and he, he was very disappointed in me because I didn't carry on the family business. He eventually sold it um, to the United Fruit Company. It became United Brands. Long story, merged with Dunkin' Donuts. It's terrible. <laughs> Please, if you, have, if you like me, don't go to Baskin Robbins out of any... I'm not that. Um, I'm just... This is, but it's my history. And, and it's, it's what I said no to. So that I could say yes to something else. And my dad couldn't understand this. He'd worked very hard. He had attained a level of financial success that most people can only dream about. He wanted to share that with his only son. He probably got the one kid in the country that would have said no to that. He was not happy. I, I was not happy that I was displeasing him. But I had to be true because something else was calling me very, in a very different direction. And as the years passed, I became much healthier than I'd been and, and um, I began to feel connected to a source of, of wisdom in, 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 in the natural world and in the human spirit. And I wanted to give that voice and eventually wrote a book in the, in the 80s called Diet for New America, which Dixie was referring to, and, and it became a, a bestseller. It sold literally millions of copies. And, and, and my poor dad, he, he was like, why would anyone listen to his, his, this kid who didn't have the brains to, you know, the good sense to follow in, in his footsteps? He was offering me this. He couldn't figure it out. He didn't like it. And then one day, in 89, he went to uh, his cardiologist because he was very ill by that point. My dad had diabetes. And it had progressed to the point that the prognosis was he might have to have an amputation of a foot or even a leg. He might go blind. This is serious diabetes. And he also had very high blood pressure so that he was on what he called horse pills. He had to take them every day. And, 
And, and they, the doctor said he'd have to take him for the rest of his life, and there was a lot of side effects to those, and he didn't like that at all. And, and his weight was out of control, and, and he ate a lot of ice cream. And, and his cardiologist said to him, uh, Mr. Robbins, you're a very sick man right now. And the best we can do for you is juggle your medications and try to control some of the side effects that are bothering you. And try to make your few remaining years a little more comfortable. And I, I really appreciate that doctor for leveling with my dad. But what amazed, amazed me, one, the reason I'm telling you about this, is the next thing that happened was the doctor said, the cardiologist said to my dad, on the other hand, if you are willing to make major changes in how you live, there might be a different prognosis. And my father said, what do you mean major changes? And the cardiologist reaches behind him and gets uh, my book and hands it just, <laughs> you should read this book. <laughs> And amazingly, this was early in Diet for New America's life, and, and uh, I only mentioned Baskin Robbins once in the whole book. And the cardiologist hadn't, didn't know that there was a relationship between the author of the book and his, his patient. And my dad did not tell him. And my dad did not tell him he already had a copy, an, an autographed one. I'd sent him an autographed one. But he, 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 just, but he took home, he took it, and. You see, now the book had been, from my father's point of view, blessed by the high priest of Western medicine, <laughs> the highest priced cardiologist in Rancho Mirage, California. So he, my dad began to read it. He was scared. And I'm sure he read the copy the doctor gave him, not the one I'd signed, <laughs> because, but he, he, he started to make small changes and he got results. So he made more changes, and he got more results, and he made more changes, and he got more results. And over the next two and a half years, he got to the point where he wrote me and said, Johnny, it's incredible. It's unbelievable. You are right. <laughs> and, and, and he said, now, I'm not a card-carrying vegetarian. <laughs> He said, but the truth was he stopped eating meat except at fundraisers that he'd attend. If they served it, he wouldn't say no there, but he didn't have it in the house. He stopped eating sugar. He stopped eating ice cream, <laughs> amazingly. Um, and the high blood pressure that his doctors had told him, you'll have to take these drugs for the rest of your life, he no longer needed the drugs. His diabetes went into virtual remission. He no longer needed insulin or diabetic pills. Nothing was amputated, he didn't go blind, he lost 60 pounds, his cholesterol came down tremendously, all his blood levels were improved dramatically. His golf game improved five or six strokes. <laughs> that may have been in his world the most important, I'm not sure. But he, he really did, he lived uh, 18 more years, most of them very healthy. And, and we, we had a rapprochement during that time, and we, there were things still we couldn't talk about. We had different values in many respects. But he forgave me for disappointing him. He actually appreciated that I'd followed, as he put it, my own star, which is rather poetic for a guy like that. And, and, and I felt that I was able to give him something more important than I would have had I fought, done the obvious thing, done what he expected, and, and carried on the ice cream company. Because he said to me once, he said, the thing that bothers me the most about you, and I was like, well, what's that with the list, you know? He said, the thing that bothers me the most about you is everybody else I've ever met has their price, except you. <laughs> I took it as a compliment. I, I don't know if he meant it that way, but I took it that way. I, I did. And, and 
I said to him, Dad, I have a prayer. I'm cheap, I'm cheap. But it's just measured in a different coin. You know, it's, it's, and he was kind of stupefied by me and bewildered and, and, and sometimes irritated. But in the end, very, very appreciative because he saw the results in his own life and body. And honestly, if, there, if my dad can make a change like that, there's hope for just about anybody. And, and that the fact that he could forgive me and, and come to be proud of me, I appreciate that about him, honestly, more than I do, for example, his business achievements, which were prodigious, because this is of the heart. And for someone in his position, the kinds of financial rewards that he was experiencing, our society puts so much status on that, so much power into that. It, it can be very difficult for such a person to see their way past that, that definition of success. And, and that he could, to some extent, was to me the most rewarding aspect of it. And I got to feel that I could help him. Now, I got this guy in my life that I mentioned to you that I spent yesterday with. I don't know if he's going to listen. I, there have been two other men in my life that I've loved dearly who um, both were very, they admired me, they admired my work, they, they loved me, they, they, and they were for a time vegetarians, vegans, um, health conscious, and then they s slipped back and one of them died of a heart attack, um, and the other suffered a very, very severe stroke that has impaired him. He's still alive, but um, so, tremendous uh, impairment. And I, I don't know sometimes what to do when someone you love is doing self-destructive things. And I, I try to be an example, and, an, and I try to inspire, and I try to evoke the positive and the, the courage and the honesty and the peace of mind. But we all have what we're dealing with, what we're dealing with. And I, and I see that the greater planetary anguish is like that. Um, as a society, as a, as, a, as a species almost, we are doing some very destructive things, very self-destructive things. We're damaging the human spirit. We're, we're, when, when we feed our grain to livestock, while elsewhere there are people starving, and we feel entitled to do that, because we're wealthy enough to afford the meat. And we don't even think about the people who are going without because the, the food resources that could feed them, the land, the water, the energy, the human labor, it's going to feed livestock that the wealthy only can eat. That, that tears me up. It just feels completely wrong. There's a billion people, roughly, on the planet today suffering from diseases caused by not having enough food to eat. You know, various forms of malnutrition. Some of them are literally starving to death. Others are just simply partially starving to death. And, and meanwhile, there's another billion or so people on the planet suffering from diseases of excess. Excess cholesterol, too much calories, too much food, too, too much meat, way, way too much meat, too much dairy bars, too much ice cream, you know? And I look at that strange mirror image, that strange paradox of a billion of these and a billion of those, and I go, what will it take for us as a species to see the sickness of that as a call to a healing action that we take on behalf of us. Oh, if any of us is going hungry, none of us can be at peace. If any of us is suffering cruelty, all of us are part of that. 
We are bound, we are interwoven with one another so much more than we realize. I think it's part of the trance, part of the lie, part of the deceit that, we, that, that, that keeps us disconnected that says we're separate, individuals only, when really we're part of each other's dreams, we're part of each other's hearts, we're part of each other's needs, we're part of each other's love in mysterious ways, powerful ways, beautiful ways sometimes. And so I'm looking always for that beauty, the beauty in the human soul, the beauty, beauty possible in our actions, how we can walk our talk, sing, sing our, 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 the song that's, that's in our hearts with the way that we live. Look the animals that we meet in the eye knowing we're not part of their suffering, we're part of their, their, their um, relief. Look at other people and know the way we live as much as possible is to live simply so that others may simply live, to eat simply so that others may simply eat. I mean, I really do dream of a, of a world in which everyone eats. Every child has enough to eat. And every child has opportunities to grow and to live with self-respect and to be part of a way of life in which we respect ourselves and each other and the living web. It is not a utopian fantasy. It is a survival imperative. It is, in fact, the step we need to take if we're going to endure on this planet, if civilization is going to thrive. And so I see something very revolutionary in these simple acts that we're taking. And whether you call yourself a vegan or a vegetarian, or partially, or somewhat, or mostly, or completely, is less important to me than that you take the action you take with as much compassion and consciousness as you can. And I want to appreciate you for that for every action that you have taken as consciously and compassionately as you could, for every choice you've made, every decision you've made, every opportunity you've see, seen and taken to add a little more beauty into the world, a little more love and a little more light. Because in doing that, you've made it possible for others to also take the steps to walk into the greater light that calls us all and is why we're here. Thank you very much. Before you leave, I just wanted to make a few remarks. Um, I know we ran a little bit longer, but you know, we've made new friends and we've met people we haven't seen for many years, and this is our last night together, so I thought it would be okay, and especially with John. Uh, and John, I want to tell you, I am so pleased to hear about you and your father re reconciling, because that's one of the saddest things in my life is that I've had very little influence on my immediate family. I do so much for trying to help the world, help the animals, and yet I couldn't help my own family. And in fact, my own dear mother warned my niece, when you grow up, please don't be like your Aunt Dixie and be a vegetarian. As if it were the worst thing I could, she could ever do in her life. And that hurt me when my niece told me that, and I felt sad. But that niece is not only a vegetarian, she became a vegan and she's a, you know, up in Idaho and they're doing raw power, uh, it's, you know. So.
so even though I didn't have influence on my immediate family, both of my younger sisters are, are dead. And as you say, you try to help and wish you could be a, an inspiration or something for your own family. And I'm sorry that both of them, who are younger than I, are no longer here. And I, I know that they would be here if they could have followed my lifestyle. Not my sleep patterns. <laughs> I know you get my emails all early, <laughs> late into the night. Uh, but as far as my diet, and I know they would have benefited by it. So it really hurts when you see them, uh, you know, have diseases that you know that you could help them with. That doesn't mean we don't ever get diseases and that we're not going to die. But it just why why rush it? <laughs> why do it? And then why have to go on medications? You know, uh, they say that most. Uh, Americans spend around $3,000 a year on drugs after the age of 60. And I don't have any drugs. I'm not eating, you know, drink, drinking anything that needs drugs. I don't. So I've saved $3,000 every year because I'm now 78, almost 79. So, you know, look how much money I saved. <laughs> The thing is that even, it, there's nothing big deal about being 78 or 79 today. What's the big deal is you don't have the diseases that people often have. So they live into, you know, their 70s and 80s, but they're not well. And I'm still putting on vegetarian congresses. And I don't know if you were there today, but I was dancing with one of my students who was a, the Chinese acrobat. He was my student, and I had more influence on him than my own family. He became, he, he took gymnastics from me, and he's now a, an accomplished acrobat. So he started with me. I can't uh, take claim for what he can do now. It's fabulous. But the fact is, he became a vegetarian and now a vegan. And he says it was because of his inspiration of being in my class. And so... I told him it was wonderful because I think I gave him not just his vocation, but I gave him a healthy life. And that really made me feel good because I never preached about it when I taught school for 28 years. I just, I just was myself. And he noticed how much energy I had, how I was so involved in teaching dance and gymnastics. And yet I was just eating carrots and <laughs> celery and, <laughs> you know, this nuts and seeds and the strangest kind of food. <laughs> And wanted to know more about it and when I told him he thought wow she can dance like this I was in my 40s or 50s he's doing his 30th reunion right now and they've invited me back so that's nice uh, but the thing is that he uh, you know he recognized that this must be something special I better learn more about it and you know became a vegetarian and he's still performing his acrobatics and he's 50 how many of you saw his acrobatics in there? Wasn't he fabulous? At 50. So I, I told everybody, okay, become a vegan and you can be an acrobatic as good as, as Wayne when you're 50 and you can tap dance like me when you're 78. Not quite. But anyway, you'll be healthier. So I really want to thank all of you for being here. And it's a little long tonight, but as I said, you know, we won't see each other. Maybe we'll never see each other again. But one of the things I love about our, our annual World Day Festival is the energy. Have any of you ever noticed it's like a vortex when you come to the, the World Veg Festival? I don't know. I just feel a, an energizing uh, quality and it really helps us go on and I there are some speakers here will some of them stand up who were t spoke today please stand up those of you who are speakers yeah not just today over the whole weekend yeah Saturday and Sunday so thank you so much and we also have here uh, uh, Joe Connolly, is he still here? Stand up. Where is he? Joe? Joe is the editor and founder of the Veg News, our national magazine. 
and that's where we're going to have our our uh, our reception tomorrow. So uh, I really am proud of Joe because he has done a lot for making vegetarian, vegan lifestyle uh, exciting through his magazine. So I hope you can come tomorrow and get to meet him in person and get to have some delicious vegan morsels by Miyoko Shinner, who, yes, has written the the most recent cookbook on vegan cheese that is incredible. I mean, that's the one thing that a lot of people have a hard time giving up, is cheese. And she has a very nice, wonderful, natural kind of way of, of creating uh, vegan cheese. So that's going to be tomorrow at 3 o'clock. We haven't planned any tours for our guests who are from out of the country and here for the first time. Uh, I was told it's so expensive. I wasn't sure if people would stay the full four days. I wasn't sure about that. So, so you're on your own tomorrow, those who took the four-day package. And there are so many things to do in the city um, to tour. So I hope you get to enjoy the city, enjoy the, the views of the cable cars and everything. And maybe we'll see each other again at our Veg Festival or some other International Vegetarian Union Congress Festival in the future. So goodbye, everyone. I love you all.